Our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by our friends at Sapper, the world's leading augmented reality platform and creative studio. With over 11 years of experience working with the world's biggest brands through Zapper Creative Studio. Zapper also has an award-winning web AR platform, Zapworks, that lets you create your own mobile AR magic. Finally, check out their Zap Box, the most affordable mixed reality headset on the planet. Start creating AR over at zap.works or talk to them about your next AR project at zapper.com. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Chilowitz. It's This Week in XR, Friday, August 19th, 2022. Good morning, Ted. Morning, Charlie. Happy Friday. Looking forward to an interesting conversation today. We have a great guest, our friend Tony Parisi, Chief Strategy Officer of Lamina One, will be joining us in a few minutes. We're going to hopefully get a little more of what they're up to, because we had Neil on a few months ago and uh, his yeah. crypto partner, Peter, and now uh, hopefully we'll get, we, did, we we had a really interesting conversation, but we weren't able to really we get may be We may be watching the birth of a a new blockchain, though, and I think that's yeah. pretty exciting. So maybe this one I'll understand. Yeah, uh, let's well, let's get to the news. There's not much. It's kind of a slow August week, um, but somebody did raise a lot of money. Modulate AI, uh, a company out of Cambridge, uh, just raised thirty million dollars to expand a product they've been working on called ToxMod, which hmm. uses, um, a, you know, a machine learning uh, and um, and a semantic understanding of language to identify um, bad actors. And right. in particular, people who might be grooming other people, pedophiles and so forth. It's supposedly that smart, which I've been saying for years that the moderation problem on VR platforms, not just singling out Horizon here, VR chat, um, you know, other platforms, are that they are a um, you know clear and present danger? You know, I mean, but I I don't know any adults or, or parents who would want their children hanging out unsupervised with strange adults. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a really weird thing that we've <laughs> created here. So if if ToxMod can solve that, they deserve a lot more than thirty million dollars. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a considerable amount of of dollars when you think about that vertical, that vein. Yeah. But if you expand it out into you know across all things Web three related, then it's probably very significant, right? Well, well, I mean, you take a look at Fortnite, right? Because they have proximity voice. So if I'm fighting with you, I can talk and you can hear me. But again, what is the difference, the technology has to understand the difference between me just trash talking you in a competitive game and me doing something dangerous and offensive. Right. Well, and if you think about potentially the, the larger use case, like let's assume hopefully the best of humanity and that uh, these kinds of use cases where really bad actors looking to do really bad things to underage people is is very much an edge case. It's going to happen, but let's not hope it happens a lot. But the the more universal edge case, which you and I have ex experienced, is in various platforms like Rec, Rec Room and VR Chat. Um, there's just a bunch of kids just like overwhelming the platform, and it becomes annoying to try and even play games or be in there, right? So how do you filter that in some way, shape, or form and silo them off? Like, you know, people want to be with people that are respectful to whatever they're doing and not sort of ruining the experience, right? Yeah. So. Maybe there's a bigger maybe there's a bigger play there. I guess we'll see. I I think this um, mixing up of people, uh, regardless of age, is 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 got to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, it, it's not going to end well. No, it won't be. Uh, obviously, there aren't pedophiles driving up and down our streets every day. There aren't that many of them, thank God. But um, certainly, it's a lot easier to um, uh, to log into VR chat than it is to find somebody in physical reality. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just think it is, you know, and, and yeah, kids are, are a problem. I mean, it's a problem when we go into their world, which is rec room, where we don't really belong. And it's a problem when they're in our world. You know, I'm I'm teaching a class in, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going around VR chat or Horizon, and there are all these random little kids just kind of jumping just in and following us right, around. Exactly. Eh, by and large, I mean, I don't mind, and I try and be friendly. I am a teacher, but uh, it is a little weird. It's all yeah. I always feel like. Do your parents know where you are? Know what you're doing right now? Yeah. yeah. Well, look, and and you know, in the broader technology sense, 
we all know that cyberbullying is a real thing and it has caused, you know, yes, harsh, harsh yes, and course. often terrible, terrible consequences. So any anybody that has that aspiration to just help it, you know, find its way a little bit and, and create some gates and some some ways to, to stop it, I think is a good thing. I think it's positive. Right. So we'll we'll have high hopes for for our friends at Modulate in Cambridge. Good on them, 30 million, still a lot of money. Um moving right along. Um, USC has added an immersive storytelling lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are joining the long list of co country, uh, uh, colleges and universities, including the two where I teach at the moment, Chapman University and Arizona State University. Uh, it is joining those schools and many others uh, to have a more robust uh, role in, in training immersive uh, storytellers and creators. So yeah, pretty, pretty great. Yeah, and they they it, it was raised from from a guy I I don't know well David Gannick who has a company called City Lights they made the King yeah. Tut VR experience that had positron shares. Yep, I know David. Yeah, yeah, and, I and know so Dolphin. so uh, I guess he is bankrolling it and uh, they're setting up a lab there with with uh, a theater with positron shares and all sorts of other stuff that will uh, give people the tools they need to make. Um, uh, creative projects through the USC Film School in yeah. uh, extended reality. So, well, and I think I think this is starting to become. I wouldn't call it a trend yet within education, but it's a pre-trend. I'm on the board of the University of Nebraska has an emerging media school that our friend Megan runs, and uh, they are doing really exceptional things. It's just started a couple of years ago, and I'm also uh, Kansas helping... has a Johnny Carson School that's of the, Broadcasting. Yeah, that's, that's, is that the one? Funny. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm helping that one a little bit and also involved in the AFI, um, trying to uh, learn how to expand uh, their offerings out of traditional film and television into uh, a more modernistic approach to entertainment. So it's fun. It's an interesting part of what I what I get to do. Uh, one thing I posted on the website, which I think you would really be interested in, is a short video called The Tragic Fall of Neos. Do you yes. know Neos? I, well, I know a little bit of it. I mean, this is this kind of like is in that sort of moment within um, uh, like, is it was it kind of another second life, but really focused on the VR platform. Um, maybe a, a really good story of, of, you know, timing is everything, right? Yep. In terms of just a little bit ahead of what Web3 was and is, but has a, and had this, this quite large viral community, right? For a period of time that was sort of growing and then kind of fell off the rails, right? Um, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with them. They're they're kind of uh, fighting for their life right now, uh, as the founders have uh, broken up, and um, their cryptocurrency that they introduced into their virtual world um, almost shook the thing down. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to fight their way back. It was a very insidery thing for a while. Yeah, uh, I have heard of them in the past, but this video is is the best, it's tells a great story indie. about yeah. two indie guys who really built something substantial with the help of a great community and how they um, lost control of it. Yeah, I think a lot more people will now find it because we're talking about it because a few people shared it with me just on text, you know, friends yeah. of mine who are in the biz and like, hey, do you right. know about this story? And at first I was like, I kind of remember. So then I like, oh, wow, look at this. This is a whole, there's a whole drama here. There's a whole, yeah. there's a whole thing going on. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Our guest uh, who will be here any moment is Tony Parisi. Uh, he is the chief strategy officer of Lamina One, uh, the startup uh, that uh, Neil Stevenson, the novelist uh, and former uh, former Magic Leap executive, is behind. Um, so not totally clear on what they're building. Tony yeah, might be able to give us some clues. It's it it it. Um, they're, they're trying to build a Web3 backbone to the emerging metaverse that can glue things together. So yeah. hopefully- we had, uh, we had Neil and uh, his his the partner on the crypto side of things uh, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast. Right, it was actually a couple of months ago. Time oh, flies when you're having fun. Time goes fast, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, they weren't really able to give us a lot of clarity. I mean, there was a lot of uh, excitement around it. And we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll watch this space and you'll tell us more 
when you're able to uh, about what this may not about. be the day that they're able to, but um, we'll Tony, Tony may be better at explaining it now that he's been doing it for a few months. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll learn a little bit and we'll hear. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be interesting. Hello. Hey, Tony. How are you? Tony. Good. Good to see you. You too, bud. It's been a long I like time. your radio in there. It looks like you've set up. A whole... Oh, you're in your recording studio. So you've got your full recording studio activity going on. <laughs> yeah, well, it's my satellite recording studio because I'm still recovering from knee surgery. So I had my son bring up half of my gear from downstairs. <laughs> oh. so we now have three functioning uh, recording studios in one house. <laughs> Plus Marina's sculpture studio. So there's a regular factory going on here. It's fun. It. How are uh, you guys? What's happening? We're uh, good. We're good. Just uh, uh, getting ready for the semester to start and winding the summer down uh slow news week but uh great to have a friend on the show yeah oh uh, god we, yeah it's gonna be fun we were just um we were just saying that we had you and neil on the show a couple months ago and uh and you guys were so pretty hush hush about them and uh, is there more you can tell us now yeah i mean i'll be able to get into a little bit more details than peter and neil did um last time and in particular if you want to ask things around xr and the immersive side of this that's my domain here obviously that's why i'm at the company so yeah, we can I mean, definitely think, dive into that i think maybe the first the first place to start is kind of the top line like you know give us the the vision now after you've had a few months to sort of settle into it and what you're working on what the plan is what the goal set is i think that's kind of what the listeners here would be interested in and the, and the wider world that is tracking you would be interested in right now absolutely happy to do that um yeah and no caveats in particular no sacred cows or nothing like that one other tip for you there's going to be a really exciting another exec announcement i don't know if you saw about Jamil. I, I did your pr person tipped me off but i didn't want to say anything on the show because i think it's embargoed still uh not on Jamil, but the other one yes new hire yeah does ted know about this Ted does not. I did not. not. I did not. All right. I'm just going to tease you then. Citizen. When, did not when, people, when people tell me things under embargo, I try not to blurt them out on the yeah. show. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, and I was going to do that, but it sounds like it's not going to be announced till Wednesday. So I don't think you, I mean, when are you guys going to go live with this content? A couple of hours from now? Yeah. So it, let's not. I mean, we can just talk about more exciting. Well, anyway, I think it's exciting team. that you guys are, are building the team. Yeah. Uh, that's um, obviously. Uh, and Ted, you'll know this person, I'm sure. So it's, it's exciting. I'm excited. Yeah, well, then Wednesday, we'll you. watch the Twitter storm. And you'll, yeah, absolutely. You'll know what's yeah. happening. Sorry to cut you off, Charlie. Yes. Carry no, no, on. that's that, that's fine. That's um, so. Uh, but but tell us tell us what you can without revealing anything under embargo. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, about this person. No, about the company. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, we, we, we will. We'll get into it. I'll tell you everything. Do it. Yeah. Are we recording? Yeah. We are recording. Oh, yeah. oh I did not. Live and in right. person. Oh, there's a little red doohickey. I wasn't paying attention. All right. Here we go. <laughs> um, are we doing any that we officially do you want to? I already us? introduced you, although you are a man who needs no introduction. Oh, thank you. Great. Uh, hey, guys. Good morning. Um, I'm really excited about what we're doing at Lamina One. I joined back in June as a chief strategy officer. Uh, so sort of second in command on strategy to Peter, our CEO, working closely with the rest of the exec team and now starting to build out a team of uh, people to make things, um, which, of course, is important. We've got to actually <laughs> make and deliver something. And people have been asking us a lot about what that might be. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, these uh, blockchain companies, which we are effectively right, we're launching a new layer one blockchain. There's a lot more to the story than that. And I'll unpack it. Uh, they tend to launch with, you know, a set of principles. And they build a community on a Discord pretty much immediately. And so it's very interesting because we have thousands of people on our Discord. We probably hit about 2,000 in the first day or two. Uh, and it's in the 5,000 range now, I think at least. I've lost count. Um, and pretty much everyone's asking, what are you guys doing? And so it's a completely reasonable thing to ask for a new company that's launched and made a big splash like we have. So understood. Um, we will be releasing uh, what we're calling a light paper at some point in the near future, which will get to the principles part of this and more the blockchain white paper part. But from uh, my standpoint, I am happy to talk. I've done AMA sessions already on our Discord. Happy to talk about specifically what we're planning to do kind of later this year and into next year. By the way, tell yeah. us what you're up to. So as we know, Lambda One's a purpose-built blockchain for the immersive metaverse. And I'm qualifying it because so many people throw throwing the metaverse term around. And when you look at Web3, 
the kids doing web three now with their nfts and all these uh, you know things happening to them it's the metaverse i don't actually argue with that i 100 agree with that and i'd love to come back and have a discussion if you guys want to get into sort of the philosophy of it i i actually believe that um that said i don't think that's the metaverse a lot of us immersive and spatial computing folks envision which is highly interactive mostly 3d a lot going on and, and you know, everything from intimate little chat spaces in 3D to massive multiplayer experiences and a lot of different kind of uh, collaborative 3D stuff on the internet, right? And, and new devices on your flat screens, all of that. So what we're doing at Lamina One is purposely intended to be able to support lots and lots of virtual objects getting minted, high transaction volumes, and not just minted, but you know traded followed throughout their life cycle until they're you know used up and destroyed or powered up and get more powerful if they're game objects um and that's a big ask right there to, to do that on a blockchain uh virtual land type of stuff on a blockchain though we at least no time soon are planning on getting in the virtual land business if you will this is not a speculative play but we know that lots of folks uh doing you know immersive metaverse stuff want to create spaces that they can then parcel out you know and and provide ownership to so we'll power that as well so that's the block all the blockchain technology will be uh purposefully intended to support that that said there's two more important things you need for an immersive metaverse a decentralized set of system services so you know if you think about a multiplayer game today and what goes into supporting that um everything from the hosting of the world to collaboration and the sense of you and I are in the same world together, messages going back and forth, the asset storage and delivery for all that rich 3D data, and um, possibly the streaming rendering of that, depending on what sort of solution you're looking at. So you could do a really highly photorealistic world and stream the rendering, though we all know there's some cost of ownership, you know, expense issues around that, but on the high end, that kind of solution down to, you know, um, rendering on your device and everything in between. All of these things being delivered as a set of decentralized system services. So not one big game server somewhere in the cloud, but anyone who's a node operator on the Lamina One network could potentially be an ISP, if you will, providing services like that too. I want to make this abundantly clear. Lamina One's not building all of those things. There's lots of technology out there that does this already. So part of the plan over the next three, six, nine, 12 months is to work with industry partners on all this and some might be you know full-on strategic partnerships at a deep level some might be purely like this is an ecosystem these are all the standards and specs we're supporting uh jump in and participate if you want so you know part of my journey in the next several months will be to find those kind of technologies and work with partners and ecosystem players to do that so that's sort of the second leg of the table if you will and then the third one and this is really near and dear to my heart is uh, an ecosystem of open tools so anybody can build and anybody can build the kind of things I was talking about, the ranging from simple little experiences where Charlie, with no production experience, you know, in terms of 3D modeling yourself, you know, you put together things from templates and I don't mean to insult you, Charlie, but, you know, you talk about this a lot, like this needs to be really simple. I shouldn't need to have game development skill, right? Um, so everyone from that to like professional game devs, you know, using their own stacks, just connecting to our blockchain, that all needs to be in play. So those are kind of the three technology pillars. And then, of course, there's this fourth part of the business Neil's already talked to you about a bit um, where he's thinking about first party content and what Neil Stevenson does. Right. Um, and so that's it in a nutshell. We have not put that into crisp marketing materials yet for everybody <laughs> to see our website. Still just a couple of pages. So understood. There's a lot of questions there. It's pretty clear in my mind uh, what that all means uh, in terms of specifics. Later this year, we have to at least uh, release software development kits for the two big game engines and the web. So it starts there. So anyone who's a developer working in Unity, working in Unreal, or building uh, any kind of website that wants to connect to this chain and rendering in WebGL with 3JS or Babylon uh, could connect to our chain, mint virtual, virtual objects, do all the things I already talked about in terms of the use cases. And that'll come out later this year. We're not... Uh, we don't quite have the dates crisped up yet, but that's sort of, you know, just getting started so people can talk to our blockchain. Some of these other things I mentioned on the system services side will probably roll out more like early next year. So when uh, um, I'm be betraying sort of my ignorance about 
uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency. So when you say there's going to be a Lamina One, Layer One blockchain, does that mean there will be a currency associated with it? Uh, so help me understand how that yeah. works, right? How do we yeah, go? So there's, a, there's an L1 token. And that L1 token will be used for all the economics that happen on this blockchain. So every time a transaction happens, for example, to create a new virtual object and put it on the blockchain, call that a transaction yeah. minting, right? right? That will be done with the Lamina One token. And anyone who's a service provider or a node operator, anybody participating in what has to happen to make sure that transaction is secure and reliable, you know, basically proof of stake validation of that is also participating with Lamina One coins. Um, since proof of stake is potentially so frictionless and the gas fees are so low, um, how do node operators uh, get compensated? I mean, I understand they get coins for minting them, but you can't mint that many coins for a uh, relatively low friction transaction, right? Yeah, um, probably Peter's the best person to talk about about the specifics of the economics. I mean, the idea is effectively transaction. So in other words, he's trying to figure that out. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we're figuring that out in terms of what that exact pricing and sweet spot is. It's a, you know gas fees versus other possible you know transaction fees in general. Right. You know, as other ways to do this. Sure. Of and course. he's definitely the best person to, to talk to about this. And yeah. I am the first person to tell you. You know, everything I know about immersive and spatial computing, I mean, it's a zero when it comes to blockchain. I'm learning from Peter. <laughs> yeah. He is sort of my counterpart, compliment, if you will, because he doesn't know a lot about, you know, 3D and immersive stuff. He's just super brilliant on... So put the, you uh, together and you've got one visionary. <laughs> yeah, we got one CTO right now, basically, right? And so we're working on that too, to, you know, bring more firepower in at the CTO level. Uh, we are hiring technical staff right now who are really capable builders on both blockchain and 3D stuff as we speak. We've got some, you know, offers out there already. Um, so, yeah, but I just I wish I could tell you more about how this is going to work. And, and at the end of the day, actually, this is even an economic model question more than it is the technology of blockchain. And, you know, that's that's not my wheelhouse at all. I don't I don't even think about that stuff. I uh, kind of break into a cold sweat when we talk about the, the business side. Okay, of that. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I'm uh, I'm not alone. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'll I'll present the question this way, Tony, to see how much you're able to answer on this. And it may be that we need to bring Peter back in uh, at some point to discuss this. But as I'm hearing you walk through your vision of what you know you're doing and where this this your layer sits within this whole ecosystem of the blockchain. So I'm I'm thinking, all right, so a lot of our listeners know this, invest in crypto in various ways to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Charlie and I are sort of in that bucket. Uh, and as you're talking, what I understand is there are obviously what we refer to as the application layer of all these people building these different things, uh, virtual lands, virtual experiences, you know, game-like experiences, ways to share social commerce and et cetera, right? All the things that happen in the real world now bringing into this Web3 world, right? And then there's a whole bunch of different blockchains that are effectively competing with Ethereum, sort of the original blockchain that Bitcoin was built on and everything else was built on because of some of the challenges of trying to do something much more ubiquitous. So you've got Solana and Polygon and Polkadot and Cordano and probably a litany more that are not, those are the big four or five. Can you give us some sense of where your differentiation is from that model of there's tons of these applications already out there, which you talked about, right. but you're not going to be one of those application builders. You're going to be the, the level that supports all that. That That's right. sounds like what I'll use Solana and Polkadot are attempting to do and EOS is attempting to do. So how do you, at least for our listeners now, give some sense of what you're doing that's different than that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that is that is the trillion dollar question, if you will. And here's the thing. We're not ready at this point to get specific about features or performance and so on, you know, and how that's differentiated from these other chains, simply because we haven't done that work yet. Mm -hmm. okay. What we have done is said, we know just as technologists, we know that these chains were not built from the ground up to serve these needs, mm -hmm. to serve these right. use cases. We, as in, you know, especially, you know, folks like myself, know what it takes to power a always running 3D virtual world. And we know the functional requirements are going to be different. 
and we are committed to serve those. And we're going to find out as these applications roll out in the next you know, year, one, two, three years, where those differentiation points are. And so what we've done is forked the Avalanche blockchain, an existing high-performance proof-of-stake blockchain, as a starting point, just knowing, again, as practitioners, we're going to need to make some changes. And we're going to work with you know, everyone in the ecosystem and industry to start servicing what those needs are. But we don't know a priori. We won't know because now we are bringing together a layer one blockchain with a set of virtual system services to create new kinds of experiences that heretofore have only been done inside the walls of a Roblox or inside the walls of an Epic. And now we're saying we want to power an open ecosystem for the industry broadly around this stuff. So we don't know how this is going to play well, out. That's a fine answer. And, and, yeah. and I, I think, well, it's interesting that I think the, the most interesting piece of that is that you mentioned that you're forking off the Avalanche blockchain. So, which, by the way, I think is the worst name of all the blockchains because Avalanche gives us the, the name, sense. right? It's the, the wrong, going in the, the wrong, wrong direction. Story. It's like when the uh, when the um, the the new uh, you know super fast airplane company is called Boom because of the sonic boom, which I oh, right, right, I don't right. think it's probably the greatest name for an airline company, right? Uh, but at, regardless of that, that's just a little comedy, a little levity. Exactly. Well, we have um, a nice name, even though no one knows what it means, but it means but, layer, but, as you know in Latin, right? So, so you know, you're you're kind of sort of stating that you're a bunch of smart guys that really understand immersive content and where this is going. And you're living off the tenants of one of those blockchains that exists to provide a more efficient use case. Charlie talked about proof of stake. It's a staking type blockchain. The mining is a bit different you know, than, than Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's not so onerous and, and it's a different uh, philosophy. But, but right. you're not building the blockchain. You're not building a whole new blockchain here. You are, no, we're not building a whole new blockchain. Right. And I think that's uh, probably what a lot of people thought about Lamina One is, oh, they're maybe they're building a a brand new thing that's even more efficient or different, you're actually just forking off someone else's technology to do it. So that's good. Yeah, you know. yeah that's good. And also, though, let's not lose sight that Peter is an, you know world expert on how these chains work and knows where a lot of the problems are in the existing chains today, even down to you know where there's performance issues and say Ethereum virtual machines, other things that are basically the you know operating stuff that happens a virtual machine is what powers all the smart contract code yeah. that happens on these newer blockchains like Ethereum. Uh, and Polygon. So they all support what's called the Ethereum virtual machine, which is sort of like the you know JavaScript interpreter or the Java virtual machine, if you're familiar with these technologies. It's running these this compiled code that can run on the blockchain. And so Peter also knows like a lot about the issues of performance there, where the Avalanche chain itself can be improved, because Avalanche itself, if you unpack it, is three different interoperating chains doing different consensus things. And this is, again, where I start glazing over, but I'm trying to learn. <laughs> um, and so it's important to understand that we're coming from a place where, you know, our basic our basic idea is the true metaverse as we would envision it for you know an open place for creators to succeed. Uh, Neil's you know big point, which I support and big time, being a musician myself and seeing what's happened in the music industry the last twenty years, big big important thing for me. Um, that's only going to happen with the intersection, the convergence of blockchain and immersive computing. And so it has. we have to take all of that together. And again, this gets back to, yes, we're starting by forking a chain, but as engineers, we know we're gonna need to make changes. And if we were trying to operate within the strictures of an existing chain, you start getting these side chains, these roll-ups, these, these other you know, layer twos happening, and you're basically hacking on top of stuff. So at this point, we believe there's plenty of room like it's not like when it comes to blockchains we're at the end of the game you know this is like second or third inning in baseball metaphors right there's a lot more innovation to happen and we needed to have the freedom to do that kind of innovating in this new playground if you will but we wanted to we weren't going to start from a standing start when we had something that was you know existing and working already like avalanche so charlie i'll have a, a philosophical question in a moment but i don't want to stop you from any, any of the other questions you might have no <clears throat> no i was um actually gonna pivot the conversation slightly to uh the ongoing metaverse conversation about well, what I... what the metaverse is um does it even really exist uh and and why should we care because as as tony predicted among the first people to come out uh, and and contribute some significant thought leadership to this. Um, you know, the metaverse is everything. So if you really want to define the metaverse, you really can't even exclude reality. Right. 
So, um, you know, and, and also, I, I mean, at this point, um, you know, it's sort of like, is Web3 the metaverse or is the metaverse Web3? I mean, we all know it's so contained within the metaverse, but a lot of these things have been conflated together, right? Even though we feel like we have control over the language, we really don't, right? Who controls language? A million people together control it. So it seems to me the definition is, so, so the two things that have been really interesting to me is one, the way Web3 has come to be conflated with the metaverse. I mean, I, I think we all understand the real meaning of it came from Gav, Gavin Wood, the co-founder of Ethereum, when he was mad at Twitter and said, can't we have a decentralized Twitter so mm -hmm. that Twitter isn't in charge of my friends network, right? That's where the whole Web3 conversation- Which is hilarious started. because basically Web3 is actually all happening on Twitter. So that's ironic because right. <laughs> that's, where, uh, that's where all the action is. Yeah. It's like, it's all on Twitter and then you jump in Discord. And they well, get okay. people jump so, back and forth all day. So that actually, so what you're talking about actually to me brings up the philosophical question. And it's actually a question of philosophy versus practicality, right? Mm -hmm. So the philosophy of the metaverse, the utopian philosophy is everything can be shared in various ways across various networks. And what we have with today's internet, which is largely individualized, but has certain tenants that are universal, right? Like we're all on different computers, probably on different browsers, using an application layer right now to record this session, right? But if we wanted to bring in another application to add another guest and he happened to be on a different video chat client, we couldn't do that, right? Because they have their all their walled gardens, both for profit needs and viability needs, right? They all need to maintain their code in a certain way. Right, and security. So, and security can't be so universal, but we could all be on three different browsers, all living inside this on completely different compute operating systems, which is sort of the tenets of the metaverse. But as we start to blast past this into this idea of hundreds of thousands, now millions, eventually billions of, of entities trying to interop, right? And this is maybe where Neil comes into this equation because the vision of the metaverse where everybody could do everything together all the time, well, we understand where the limitations are, right? So how do you, as a, as a company that you're building, grapple with the idea, with your ideals of much more connected goods and services across multiple entities versus those companies that say, we get that. So Epic is obviously living on both sides of this equation, right? They want things to be more open, but they also want to protect their own goods and services so that others can't profit from it. Um, so how do, you, how do you navigate that? Tony, what's, well, what's, we don't think it's an either or. Yeah, we don't think it's an either or. And, and we fully expect, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, just from the tech standpoint. So philosophically, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, it's subtle. From a tech standpoint, we're going to have uh, the software development kit so people could just build a game on a game engine and they could build a walled garden out of that, right? And that's of just course. using the L1 blockchain to transact. And that's good business for us. And that's metaverse-ish. And, you know, and, and, and my, it's the way Tony <laughs> defines these things, right? That's yeah. sort of metaverse-y. I uh, don't, I don't argue. If, you, if right. that's your metaverse, I'm good. Exactly, right? <laughs> uh, you know, so there's that. But then there's, you know, there's other layers to this, like we're talking about here, you know, which, which is we would not be able to interoperate if there weren't a certain amount of agreed upon standards and conventions. Right. So if a creator wants to create an experience or an object or a piece of content that could be experienced in lots of different places, including these walled gardens, they will do it in such a way that it's built on standard formats and standard technology that then these walled gardens can bring in. So, you know, if I'm my buddy, Larry Rosenthal, and I want to make these virtual objects, I want them to run everywhere. And for the last 25 years, I've had to pick a 3D engine like Shockwave 3D. And I, great, I have a little business. I make a few grand on that little project. Guess what happens? They shut down Shockwave 3D, his business, that content, you can't see it anymore. People don't want that to continue. That, and it's not true for video. It's not true for audio. And now it's partly not true for 3D, thanks to formats like GLTF and USDZ. So the industry is getting a clue around this. So those have to grow up to incorporate more and more interactive content. Um, so at that layer, I think there will be the kind of interoperability you're talking about, Ted, 
but I don't believe we will ever get to a place where there are no walled gardens, because I think you'll still have those same economic interests or quality or security issues that you guys have cited. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So I, I think it's more of a dial than an either or, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we've seen here with technologies like Zoom or these conferencing technologies, they're built on lots and lots of pre-existing pieces. But on top of that, Mm -hmm. uh, the companies that are innovating here then add more amazing technology, which is why a Zoom call would be really good or why, you know, some gaming experience might be better than another's because they threw more engineering at it. But the formats that maybe powered that stuff were standard. Yeah. So I think we're going to see that same kind of layer cake going forward. And that's OK. I think that's that's effectively what uh, our friend Matthew Ball's philosophy is as well, is that there will be certain things and certain tenets of how we use technology that will be just better for all parties, regardless of their profit motive, to be open standard, like the idea of HTML up to HTML5, HTML6, right? Yeah. Um, but there will be plenty of layers where they'll need to be somewhat protective. Like in your case, if someone's building a game within your world and your blockchain, will the Roblox world let all of those game assets into their sandbox to go play? Likely not. And it's likely not just because they're trying to protect their economic interests. They're also trying to protect all the world that they built, and they don't know how to do that without it breaking, right? Right. So uh, it'll be interesting to see in this course of 20, 30 years, if it gets to a stage where it's so universal that people can literally move avatars and assets and game experiences from one environment into another environment because it's so ubiquitous. But that's going to take a Herculean effort. Well, and it also would take a completely different approach by the game designers. Right, right, right. right. Because yeah, and they're not you there. don't want to see somebody yeah. in, in uh, World of Warcraft running around dressed like the Joker. Right. Well, and that's a, It works in Fortnite, probably not yeah. so well in Warcraft. Exactly. That's a design and a creative set yes. of issues that has yes. nothing to do with technology. Correct. Uh, it's often used as a straw man, if you will, though, uh, for why these worlds shouldn't interoperate or never will. And it's coming from a place, it's an almost manic defense by lots of players in the industry today because it's the new is coming at them and yeah. they don't know how to deal with it and they don't want to deal with it. And if you're a big game publisher, frankly, you don't have to deal with it. What's your motivation? You're making right. a ton of money already, right. right? But let's go to five to 10 years in the future. And this you know, a scenario you guys are painting, these use cases could be completely different. Our very yes. notions of what gaming means could have yes. really flipped on its ear already. You know, there's our notions of gaming change when Doom came along, and this happens every decade or so. So at that point, the big game publishers might be, you know, trying to reach into these more open audiences, maybe trying to launch complete titles there. Yeah. Um, we saw what happened with all the big information services, the big three back in the 90s, right? And Charlie, you were there, AOL, CompuServe, yeah. and the Prodigy, right? It's like they had to adapt to the web at some point because that's where the action was. And more and more content creators could get what they needed. And businesses could put up a shop on the web and it worked. And they didn't need to go inside these other systems. And so we yeah. could be seeing that with the larger game worlds like a, a Roblox or a Fortnite at some point. I mean, I don't know. These these are met like you, Herculean was a good word. I think you said, Charlie. I mean, it's massive, right? If yeah. this is going to happen, that interoperability. Well, and but again, I mean, it'll I, be driven you know, by for example, economics. Sandbox well, is so specific. Roblox is so specific. Oh, like art style wise, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's like, can you imagine? I mean, what other objects from the outside would you bring into Roblox? Because it's right. its own self-contained aesthetic universe. Well, and, you know, if what you want to have, whether you support this use case or not, or believe in it, is a virtual meeting for business, you don't want to look like a Lego. I'm sorry. Like you don't want to look like a Roblox character or or, or a voxel-based sandbox creature. Right, right. I mean, That's exactly just, what I'm saying. Inside yeah. of sandbox, it has a logic. But if you take right. it out of that context, it's sort of like, what the hell? Did somebody bring in a toy or... <laughs> you know, just it, it has no context so um it, yeah and this is kind of the difference almost between meaning. metaverse as technology and metaverse as destination or experience and a lot of folks are getting super oh i know and we could that, go right? down the the rabbit hole of, of virtual land right there but we don't have time <laughs> so we'll set that one aside one thing i did want to bring up with you we're running out of time now um is uh i found remarkable over the past year the way vr 
and to a certain extent, AR have been defined out of the metaverse. Like we started this whole thing yeah. thinking, well, you know, Ready Player One and um, Snow Crash and headsets and, you know, moving around inside of a 3D world as if you were physically present. But I think that is not the way we are a year later talking about the metaverse at all. Yeah, guys are dealing us out. <laughs> What's that, Ted? I said it'd be very interesting to get your perspective on it because what has seemed to have happened is the nomenclature sees, oh, well, that's an edge case. And that's an edge case upon an edge case. VR is the edge case, the web and a browser and a computer flat screen world, which of course everybody has all the time with their phone and their different devices is not the edge case. But the more futuristic, the more Neil Stevenson version of this was not the flat screen universe. What is the, let's put the thing on and you're in it universe. And that's where the web three and the metaverse starts to come to life, at least with his vision, right? Well, the man himself said it though. He thinks it's gonna play out on flat screens yeah, in, right. in so the large go. as well. I think he probably chatted with you guys about it before. He's definitely said it publicly. Well, I'm in that camp. I always have been. I mean, personally, I'm a huge fan of real-time 3D in general. So there's many ways to win there. And until these newer immersive devices, you know, get through a couple more generations and, yes. and Ted, I mean, you guys both know this, this trail of tears so far and what it takes to get market adoption yeah. and learn all the lessons and, and improve the hardware and get the software infrastructure all right. It's that's going to still take a while. Uh, the Quest is a great device. We're seeing more and more cool high end stuff coming out, mixed reality and AR on the phones. It's all happening, but where the bulk of the action is, it's still on our flat screens. It's our laptops, our phones, our tablets. That's just reality. Why would the metaverse not want to be there as well as on these emergencies? No, it has to right? be browser -based. It has to be, right? It has to be browser-based because, you, you know, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, again, you, let's, let's go to our favorite VR example with Rec Room, right? What has made Rec Room so big? Embracing the flat screen. Cross-platform, right. yeah. yeah. You know, they, they were on VR and they couldn't scale. And so then they incorporated mobile and game consoles, and now they're a unicorn. So there's a great example of a company that was doing good things in VR, but it really couldn't reach the scale that it needed to have uh, until it embraced the flat screen. Back in the day, I'm sure I've had this conversation with both of you, maybe collectively or individually, <laughs> around 2015, 2016, 2017, um, <clears throat> everyone was in that wave the wave around XR and getting that VR investment money. But I'm sure I told e either of you multiple times, mark my words, they're going to, they're not going to be just VR only, but at the time they had to pitch it actually right. as VR right. only, not even VR first, right? The psychology of the venture community, right? right. It's like, well, we don't care about that other stuff. What are you doing about VR? Right. Right. We've all <laughs> and, questions that would right. never be asked today. Right. Now it's like, I mean, to go back to, you know, to, to 2019, forget it. The VR winter was starting to happen, right? It's like, uh, we don't want to see a VR pitch, right? <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of that's just the sociology yeah. of investment, right. right? But it was clear that in order for them to scale, any of these guys, these guys to wave, you know, you pick your favorite company that was doing XR stuff and, and position that way. They all had to go flat screen to show adoption and start building their business. And I don't see there's anything wrong with that. So I wish we could uh, as a species or as a collective community, just embrace the nuance and understand that it could be all of these things and it doesn't have to be an either or. But, you know, back to your original point, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I feel like us immersive, you know, in the hardware side, us immersive um, enthusiasts are getting a bit dealt out of this current conversation. Um, and so I hope it swings back or at least get, reaches some equilibrium here so that we can all understand that this stuff is going to be so much better when you can fully immerse yourself. And, and again, I mean, Apple hasn't played. Apple hasn't played its hand. I think we. Apple are, hasn't played. You know, again, exactly. this is the second inning. It's a long game. Uh, you know, the starters aren't even finished with their business yet. So, um, I I don't uh, expect there to be you know a definitive answer. Uh, in the next decade. Uh, it's one that will form out of many things converging, as, as we know. So uh, interesting to handicap it and watch it unfold in real time, uh, and good to do so with uh, humility, uh, knowing how long it's taken just to get here. You know, decades, really. Um, yeah, and, and good to be in it with you guys, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. Still um, doing it together. I like to say we were there uh, at the beginning, and it's still the beginning. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent right, <laughs> Tony. It's so great to hang out with you. Great to see you in the 
uh, virtual world and hopefully we'll all be together in the real soon. How's your knee doing? You recovering? I am recovering um, almost off the crutches because I had surgery at the end of June. So I kind of go through the whole cycle again in crutches and then cane and uh, so I'm getting there. So I hope to be, you know, sort of functioning at the level I would like in September. Great. Thanks for we'll, asking. We'll see you out and about in the real. Um, yeah. Ed and everybody else have a great week. We'll see you right back here next Friday. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, guys. And we're out. We're out. We're going to, Ed and I are just going to jump on and redo the intro. Cool. And then, you know, edit as needed, whatever. Yeah, I'll, I'll tag hope, you when we put it up in a few stuff. hours. Yeah, awesome. I'll tag you when we put it up in a few hours. Great and conversation. Ted, watch, watch next Wednesday for our new uh, newest hire so announcement. Now that You're going to be not, really we'll, excited. We'll stop recording. Can you just tell me? or Because I'll keep it the same secret as Charlie will, you know, if you want. Okay. Well, let's, let's stop, stop recording. recording. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. stop recording.